I'm Professor Sally Eves, and it's a real pleasure to be here today with Mikhail Boreal, who is CTO of Sujeti. And one of the things I wanted to kind of talk to you about, if that's okay, is looking at the role of tech change and the speed of change and how it's really not just affecting a specific area, for example, energy, but going much more deeply and affecting mm -hmm. work and affecting society and really diving into that with you. Okay. Well, it sounds like an exciting topic. Absolutely, absolutely. So what would you like to know about it? Okay, firstly, I think maybe looking at the topic of happiness and emotion right. and that area of technology and really bringing the human side of tech to the fore yeah. and how you feel that's evolving at the current time. Well, maybe I should start with one of our muses, uh, Professor Colotta Perez, and she dedicated her life to studying technology waves. Okay. And what she explains is that usually a general purpose technology like electricity or steam engines yes. or IT, uh, it affects society in long waves, about 70, 80 years. And then her work is focused on um, differentiating between the two phases. The first 30 years, years is about installment of the technology. Yes. It's where innovation is about making the technology first work, yeah easier to use, cheaper, more reliable, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you switch to the second phase called the deployment phase mm -hmm. where the, the topic of the focus point of innovation shifts to this area of uh, business reinvention, I would call yes, it. Yes, okay. Now what is interesting is that in this second phase, we are right in the middle of going from this mm -hmm. first phase to the second phase. And what's interesting is that in the second phase, a um, golden age yeah. could occur. It's not a given that it will occur, mm -hmm. but it could occur. And what is the definition of a golden age? Is that everybody profits yes. from the technology. And now, of course, mm -hmm. today, it's still the big tech companies that Absolutely. profit the most. Absolutely. Um, now, to reach this golden age, you have to make choices. Mm -hmm. And so the technology is offering the the, the possibilities, the options, but it's society that will make the choice. Yes. Now, in making those choices, digital happiness is extremely important. I couldn't agree more. Because so, yeah. how do we make choices in technology that actually benefit everyone? And then if we talk about very powerful technologies like AI yes. or advanced analytics, then it becomes even more important to prevent this whole idea of um, what they call um, a surveillance capitalism. Yes, right? indeed, absolutely, yes. W where companies, very powerful companies, use data primarily for their own selfish reasons and not yes. to benefit absolutely. people and the customer. Absolutely. So, now I think I'm quite convinced and I see many, how do you call it, uh, optimistic signs that just looking at your own mm -hmm. bottom line, your own uh, profitability when you look at technology decisions yeah. will not continue. I agree, I agree. Companies have to start thinking about what does technology mean for my customer, mm -hmm. but also for my employee. Absolutely. Because you cannot create a happy experience mm -hmm. for your customer if your employees are unhappy. So it's all about the trade-off, it's all mm -hmm. about the finding the right balance. Yes. And then the guiding principle, I think, should be digital happiness. I love that. I love that as a concept and as an application. I think for me, um, when we're looking about, about happiness, also about personalization as well, um, and also about value. For me, I think this is like the rise of a shared value economy. Um, and tech can be harnessed for good and it can be a real democratization opportunity. Or as you were saying earlier, there are risks like social sorting and other things that can be done with AI. So it's making sure we put that purpose of tech to the fore and having a real open dialogue like we're doing today about the pros and the cons. Well, absolutely. And then if you take into account this new generation mm. that is now coming of age, yeah. the Generation Z, or yes. as we call it, the synthetic generation, mm. this is a generation, if you come to think of it, that has never known an yes. analog world. Yeah. They were born in a digital world. They actually don't even make distinction between online mm. and offline. Yeah. They call it on life. <laughs> They're always online. Absolutely. And so this generation, technology is changing their behavior and it's changing their expectations. And so we written a paper on this yes. whole idea of the synthetic generation, where we say this, this shift in values, mm -hmm. which is always a definition of a new generation, Absolutely. right? Uh, 
Uh, the shift in value centers around three things. They are post-hierarchical. So not non-hierarchical, but post. So hierarchy is based on different things. Mm -hmm. They are post-realistic. They mm -hmm. see um, reality not as a given. They just see it as a yeah. another barrier to overcome to fulfill mm -hmm. their dreams. And most importantly, they are post-materialistic. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are still materialistic. They are not non-materialistic, but post. They need more than only material Absolutely. things. So. Um, in our research, what we have done is we always had this, this matrix where we said you have to look at your digital capability of an organization and your transformation capability, your leadership yes, capability, yes. to make sure that you're not only over-investing in technology, but changing your processes, your organization at the really same late. time. We've added the third axis, and it's the purpose axis. It's the axis of where you actually use technology and you constantly think about what does this do to people's lives. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more strongly with that. So, a yeah, social impact for me, and as I say, how tech can you know transform business, but transform society at the same time, could not be more of a more important fit. And I think you're right. Generation Z, in particular, are really driving that change. Their behaviour change is forcing that tipping point for organisations. Um, it's lovely to see what you're talking about there as a purpose axis. That being embedded into an organisational behaviour, I think, is the way forward. Yeah. I think that for me is that the rise of the new sustainable competitive advantage. So. That's really interesting. So I, I couldn't agree more with those points. Yeah, and, and and what is interesting? So I don't mm. know if if you start looking for proof of your. Yes. But I'm quite optimistic in yeah. seeing this shift. Now, of course, the deal is not done yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are still organisations that believe that they can move the other way. Yes. Um, big tech companies. Um, I won't name any <laughs> names. Uh, but they are not yet socially sustain. They don't create what I call socially sustainable innovation. Now, they have to see the light at some point, and yes. I think the new generation will actually vote with their feet I think and so. will demand that these organizations become much more responsible in the trade-offs mm -hmm. that they're making. I think, that's a, I think that's a very good point and I think when you talk about synthetic generation and that kind of hybridity between online and offline, I think it's the same thing with what you were talking about, about values and people will walk away from products and services as a consumer, also as an employee, if it doesn't fit your, you know, there's no distinction really between personal and professional, your values are embedded and they come together and if you don't show those then people will walk away with their feet as you were saying there, yeah. so I think that's where we're getting to, I think a real tipping point of action towards well, the, that now. Uh, and I, I find it very interesting. So we talked for a couple of years about the fantastic powers mm. of artificial intelligence. Yes. More and more you start to think about that with great powers comes great responsibilities. Absolutely. And so smart organizations are now starting to develop the principles or the, the guidelines or the governance yes. uh, to which they want to hold investments in technology. And then I think uh, what I found quite, quite optimistic is that most organizations that are become serious about AI, mm -hmm. they believe that they cannot leave those trade-offs okay. to the technologists. Yep. They need to take responsibility in their own hands, Absolutely. Um, start becoming what, what I call the guardian of digital happiness yes. of their customer and of their employee. I no. love that as an example. Yeah, absolutely, that's, that's well no. put. I love that. Yeah, and don't absolutely. leave that to the to the technologies themselves, yes. because we as technologies we are always extremely optimistic and yes. we always only see the good thing but mm -hmm. not the risks. You need to have mm -hmm. other people yes. starting having that dialogue as well. I think a diversity of experience comes to the fore from what you're saying there as well. You know, who, who's sure. building AI? And yes, we need people with really strong tech backgrounds, but also you need people with real creative imagination and their philosophy, history, different backgrounds coming together. And then you get, again, that creativity and innovation goes hand in hand, I think, if we embed that into the teams that are building yeah. the AI. No, and what I find very optimistic, so of course writing these reports mm -hmm. on digital happiness, which we have been doing for the last two years or so, mm -hmm. I have a lot of conversations with CIOs. Yes. And they start to, to realize that the CEO of their company comes to them yes. and saying not the question, can we build this from a technology point of view? Can we afford mm -hmm. it from an economic point of view? Okay. But the question now is, should we build it? Mm -hmm. And so 
If you, if you look at this matrix that I described earlier about digital capability and transformational yes. capability, we used to have this word for digital masters okay. called digirati. Yes. Now what I'm arguing is that next to becoming a digirati, okay. companies should become a purperati. Ah, right? They should you're become talking my language. a master Absolutely. of purpose. I love um, that. I love that. Yeah. That, that is perfect. And something I've just finished writing is literally embedded in the ESOF you just described, so I couldn't agree with that more strongly. And I think one other thing I wanted to touch on is about how technology is changing communication. So, for example, the rise of chatbots um, and how we're interacting differently. And a bit like what you said earlier, a younger and younger age, people have never been exposed to it like a, a pre-digital time. What's your views on that and how that's changing behaviour and what the implications for skills might be in, in terms of what we're learning and how we learn? Well, you see what I found very fascinating mm. with the younger generation, mm. that in many, let's say, routine questions, yes. people don't want to talk to another person. They mm. just want to yeah. go in, get an answer to the simple question, is my flight leaving on time? Yes, okay, and then go out again. Uh, now, of course, these answers have to be extremely mm. um, uh, situational. So yes. depending on where you are, you have to get the answer. Absolutely. Now, what will be the trade-off is then, of course, the people that you that, that are freed up from answering all those routine questions, one possibility could be that you get rid of them. Yeah. I don't believe in that. I think that that capacity, you should actually empower yes. and educate those people so that they can solve the really hard problems Absolutely. with empathy, with compassion, mm. with not explaining what the rules are, but actually saying, well, this is, an, yes. this is I understand that this is a big problem for you, I'm going to solve it for you. Um, and then find ways to solve it. Um, of course, not only simply following the rules, because if it was following the rules, we could have an yes, algorithm. Yes, absolutely, it. Indeed, indeed. So it's the, it's the combination, it's mm. a trade-off where you um, use the technology to the fullest extent, but at the same time, use the people yes. to do the things that they are good at. Absolutely. Um, empathy, compassion, I mean software doesn't have goals. Software, it's even in the most advanced technologies, the software is still pretty simple. Absolutely, and very specific, very narrow AI still at the moment. Absolutely, yeah. even, even in autonomous cars, it's still yeah. very narrowly focused. So yeah, absolutely. And so that's where people come in. Absolutely. That's where people are very, very good. They can read mm. between the lines, they can understand, they have empathy, they, mm. they can translate the problem absolutely. that somebody comes to you and then find a solution. Perfect, I think that's a great way to end it and I couldn't agree more with that in terms of the importance of all the areas we covered, I think really emotional intelligence probably brings some of that together, um, empathy and trust. So alongside everything we're talking about, about tech, is these cultural human aspects that really go hand in hand into transformation and development, whether you're an employee, whether you're a customer, whether you're a stakeholder in any part of that system, we need to make sure we're focusing on those areas and they benefit satisfaction, productivity, and just our general well-being hmm. and engagement and the experience that we're having with technology. No, and technology, of course, is extremely important in mm. this equation, but it's not the only thing. Exactly. I think that you should look at the values of this new generation, because whatever you do, you don't mm. want to disengage Absolutely. from the generation. Because let's face it, together with the millennials, they will be 60% of your customers Indeed. and 60% of your employees within, let's say, the next 10 to 20 years. And that's a power to be it certainly is. To, to take into account. Absolutely. So thank you so much. I think it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. So thank you very much indeed. And again, shared values. I couldn't agree more strongly with that. That's where we're going. And I think that's where sustainable competitive advantage will be coming from. Mm -hmm.